Good morning, distinguished guest. Today, we are commencing the proceedings for the second day of the 14th International Research Conference. The first technical session on defense and strategic studies will be held under the theme Military Affairs. We have six authors presenting their research at this morning session. I am sure this will be a fascinating and intellectually stimulating session. I would like to call upon Brigadier R.G.U. Rajapaksha, R.S.P., P.S.C., Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, to introduce the chairperson of this session, Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawadana. Distinguished invitees, Students of General Sir John Patalava Defense University, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, I welcome you all to the Defense and Strategic Studies Technical Session 1 of the KDU International Research Conference 2021, in which the presenters will deliver their papers on the sub theme Military Affairs. It is my pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the session. Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawadana, adjunct senior professor, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, KDU, to the audience. Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawadana of International Relations, University of Colombo, is also an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, General Sir John Kotalawa Defense University. Previously, he served as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and the head of the Department of International Relations, University of Colombo. He was appointed the executive director of the Regional Center for Strategic Studies, which is a regional think tank in South Asia since 2013. Since 2013, he has been serving as Sri Lanka's government representative to the ASEAN Regional Forum Experts and Eminent Persons Group. He is a member of the Boards of Management of the Bandaranaika Center for International Studies and the Regional Center for Strategic Studies. He has also served as visiting professor at the School of International Service, the American University, Washington, D.C., and research scholar at the Department of International Relations, London School of Economics and Political Science. He obtained his BA from the University of Ceylon and MA, PhD from the University of Washington. He has also functioned as a consultant to the National Integration Program Unit of the Ministry of Ethnic Affairs and National Integration, member of the Coordinating Committee, Center for the Study of Human Rights, University of Colombo, co-director, Center for Policy Studies and Research, University of Colombo, and the founding director of the Institute of International Studies, Candy. Whilst thanking him for being here with us today, accepting our invitation, 
I now cordially invite Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawardhana to the stage and chair the Defense and Strategic Studies Technical Session 1. Meantime, I would like to call upon our eminent guest speakers in this session, some physically and some online. Mr. N. Nilanthan, Dr. K. S. C. Silva, Colonel T. Bandara, Mr. R. I. Pinto, Major D. C. N. Hapuarachi, Mr. H. S. Vijay Singh. Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawadana will also introduce the presenters of the session to the audience. Sir, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Rajapaksa. Good morning to you all, and welcome to the first technical session of the 14th International Research Conference at KDU. This technical session is on military affairs. And what is the importance of discussing military affairs? As you know, Sir John Kotlavala Defense University introduced the hybrid degree program called BSc in Strategic Studies and International Relations. The strategic studies is a very important subfield in international relations, and it mostly deals with military affairs. Now, security is a broad concept, and we should have a holistic approach. Human security is only one aspect of security, and military aspects also constitute an important segment of security. When we say national security, it includes both military aspects and non-military aspects. Recently, there has been a substantial military engagement in non-military affairs. However, we should not ignore what is going on in the battlefield. That also shows the close nexus between military aspects and non-military aspects uh, of national security. Now, we have uh, several papers today, and the first paper that is introducing Iron Man exoskeletons in warfare. Now, this is a new area of research, but all the major important major military powers, such as the United States, Russia, China, and India have been engaged in developing this new technology. This author discusses the implications of the deployment of exoskeletons in warfare. Now to discuss this topic, we have Mr. Nilantan Nirudan, who is a defense analyst and a security scholar based in Colombo. He's a visiting lecturer at the Bandar Naika Center for International Studies and the Defense Services Command and Staff College. He has published several articles on space warfare, biomilitary in, uh, innovations, artificial intelligence, and invisibility technology. Uh, he's an occasional guest on radio and television shows to discuss global security. He is currently reading for his PhD on military theory at the FGS Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo. Now I call upon Mr. Nilandan Nirudan to make his presentation, and I should also mention the ground rules, and please take no more than 10 minutes to make your presentation. Uh, my topic is on the role of exoskeletons on the future of warfare. So, Basically, an exoskeleton is a skeletal system outside of the body. So human beings have something known as an endoskeleton, as in we have skin and tissue and muscle and all that outside of the skeleton. Whereas with an exoskeleton, such as what, let's say, insects would have, what they have is a skeletal system on the outside. 
So the whole point of an exoskeleton in warfare is to provide a type of body armor. Now, of course, this is not anything new. The concept of a body armor has existed from ancient times to modern. I mean, the medieval uh, image of a knight in full body armor, I guess, would be one of the major images that get conjured up. With exoskeletons, what we are looking at is a potential revolution in military technology, and I'll quickly explain that later as well. It's also a source of great power rivalry, as the chair rightly mentioned, countries like the United States, Russia, China, India, all of those things, all of these countries are engaged in competition with, uh, through this technology, rather. We also have to look at the threat of non-state actors harnessing this technology in the future when they sort of perpetrate their atrocities. Let's put it that way. We also need to look at, in the context of this conference, the new normal. Now, my outlook, my take on it, is that we need to have a broad interpretation of the term the new normal. Because I see many uh, experts, even security scholars, using this term, new normal, but they seem to be making it and using it in a predominantly post-COVID or COVID-centric perspective, which I think is fair. But I think we are doing ourselves a big disservice when we try to interpret a, a term like this purely in terms of COVID. I think the new normal has to be something that looks at the political landscape, the technological landscape, the social sort of cultural landscape. We have to look at many of these things. And that's when we decide what the new normal is. And I think something like this contributes to that alternative perspective on how we look at this term called the new norm. And finally, I'd also like to touch on the implications of exoskeleton technology for the future of warfare. So let me quickly run through what some of the major powers in the world right now are doing. The United States is clearly the most prominent one. They have a big company called the Raytheon Sarkos uh, XOS. In fact, I got the idea of using Iron Man for the title of the paper after a Raytheon Sarkos exhibition where they showed it to a guy called Adi Grenov, who's a Marvel Comics writer, who was one of the people who came up with the character Iron Man, who's, of course, a part of mainstream pop culture now. And as soon as Adi Grenov saw the two uh, sort of prototypes uh, in front of you on your screen right now, he was shocked and he said, my God, this is Iron Man. This is how it started. I knew we were close, but I had no idea we were this close. This comes from the person who created the character itself. And the Raytheon Sarkos is one of the, the sort of uh, the US's leading um, technology, weapons technology companies that sort of delves in many of these things. They also made something called the Guardian. The Guardian is another exoskeleton made exclusively to carry heavy weights. And this is not going to be used only for military purposes. It's going to be used for civilian purposes as well. Delta Airlines, for example, by 2022 or 2023, has already placed orders with Raytheon Sarkos to make sure that this particular Guardian exoskeleton is used for its own staff members like baggage carriers and things like that because these skeletons not only do they give you enhanced uh, protection they allow you to lift very heavy loads they allow you to run very fast they give you more durability more stamina many many things like that so it's not just an armor that we're talking about it's a proper exoskeleton that boosts your physical capabilities. Now, the, both these prototypes that you see, one, the Time Magazine, 100 Best Inventions of their respective years, the Raytheon 1 in 2011, and the Raytheon 2 this year in 2021. The Guardian won the award for the best invention of Times Magazine uh, last year. The more important one in the United States is something called the Talos the tactical assault light operator suit. It's mostly meant to be used by Navy SEALs and special operations and things like that. It's named after Talos in Greek mythology, 
which as many of you would know is this giant statue, an automaton, which sort of patrols the shores of Kratos. There are many complex requirements, however, that go into making something like this work. And therefore, no matter how much money and resources the Americans pumped into the Talos, unfortunately, at the moment, we need to consider it a failed operation because they've been unable to field it in the battlefield. Russia, on the other hand, has the Ratnik, a, a company, which has had much better success. What you see here are the first and latest generations of the Ratnik battle suit. Once again, bulletproof armor, infrared night vision sensors, the latest in everything. These guys wearing these battle suits will be far more enhanced and far more capable than soldiers in ordinary gear. In fact, Russia has already started fielding exoskeletons in places like Syria and Crimea. The picture to your left is a, a photo of an early prototype of a Russian exoskeleton being used in Syria. So this guy is diffusing bombs in Syria and the exoskeleton that he's wearing allows him to carry the equipment, allows him to walk long distances, much longer than a normal human being would be able to, which gives one person the capability to sweep an entire area for mines and bombs in a way that you would have required an entire bomb squad earlier. And on the right, you see another example of a battle suit called the Stormer. And many countries are worried that Russia is already, has already used these for operations, most uh, pertinently in Crimea. So many people say that Russia in the sort of uh, conflict in Crimea the last few years, that Russia has already fielded battle suits in the theater of operations itself, which would put it ahead of the United States. This is China. China has been delving with this as well. So this is footage from uh, Chinese Central Television last year where they had a program showing many Chinese soldiers uh, trekking across wearing these. If you look at their legs, you can see that they're wearing this special harness support. So these are all uh, uh, primitive versions of exoskeletons, prototype versions of exoskeletons that the Chinese army is wearing. And this apparently allows them to carry something like 200 or 300 kgs per soldier. And they can carry this load for many, many miles without getting tired. So as we all know, China has many border disputes, most notably with India, even though currently they don't have geopolitical problems with Russia. They have the longest uncontested, sorry, the longest contested rather, unresolved border with Russia. So you never know where that's going to go. So in mountainous regions, in rocky terrain, in places where a lot of traveling is involved, China plans to empower its soldiers with exoskeleton technology to make them even more durable. Uh, this is another example of, so China has an arms company called Norinco. So this is some of the early prototypes made by Norinco. Once again, allows the user to lift huge amounts of weight, run much faster than a human, run for much longer than a human and things like that. This is an example of where they've already started using it for civilian technologies. So uh, this is a guy just, just carrying food. This is one of these food delivery guys wearing an exoskeleton. And this means that he can now deliver far more food than the ordinary delivery man, so to speak. We'll quickly look at some of the other players as well. So Australia has developed its own exoskeleton. It's known as the OX, the OX. The Indian uh, uh, DRDO, which is the Defense Research and Development Organization uh, in charge of defense uh, research in India, they've already given out strict guidelines for what they think a good exoskeleton should be for private inventors to try their hand as well. Japan has been very prominent in the exoskeleton field for many years now, I would say since 2014 or 15. And on the civilian side, they continue to be one of the bigger sort of hubs of exoskeleton technology. And finally, we have NATO. NATO seems to have become cognizant of exoskeletons only recently. And even though it's behind the others, they are doing, they are undertaking some measures, let's say, to improve themselves. So 
uh, for example, about three years ago, they held this thing called the Battlefield Workshop Series, where they essentially had workshops trying to brainstorm with local scientists and inventors on how exactly they could do all this. One thing I want us to emphasize here is the role of science fiction, because I find that this is often completely ignored particularly in the developing world and in countries like Sri Lanka. We kind of tend to look at science fiction as something for children, something for entertainment, something that doesn't really have much intellectual value. But whenever I look at the future of technology, this is not just exoskeletons for all forms of invisibility technology, space technology, genetic enhancements, artificial intelligence. When we look at all of these different things, the what is very clear is that the scientists working at the ground level, the innovators who are making this possible, were all geeks and nerds growing up who were very heavily influenced by science fiction. So uh, if, when we look at people working in robotics today, the influence of Isaac Asimov, the influence of Robert Heinlein, of Arthur C. Clarke, all of that is so prominent. And even when you look at the guys working on exoskeletons, it's clear that these guys are very heavily influenced by cultural science fiction concepts. Iron Man, The Terminator, Robocop. We might see all of this as just brainless entertainment, as just pop culture. But we sometimes underestimate the role that science fiction plays in determining the future of humanity particularly in determining the future of technology. So this is one of those areas where we have to be very, very cognizant and even respectful of the role that science fiction plays. And finally, since I need to conclude quickly, let me just go through some of the main points here once again. So number one, the development of this technology would largely matter or be based on what is practical and what is impractical right viable versus impractical so the talos that we saw earlier the american approach of trying to create the ultimate battle suit where they imbue it with all kinds of technology and hope that it works together seems to be impractical the russians on the other hand have gone slowly step by step step by step and that means that they have been able to operationalize this thing in the actual battlefield even though it's not as technologically advanced as what the Americans were working on, at least they managed to field it instead of it being a failed experiment. Some people are worried that this will make wars easier and this will, that this will disrupt the global balance of power. And it's true. This might make it easier for countries to wage warfare because the human casualty will be low. However, I personally cannot see that as a bad thing, as in even a helmet makes wars easier because fewer soldiers die. Even a bulletproof vest makes war easier because fewer soldiers die. The fact that lesser soldiers will now die, the fact that we can now reduce human casualty, in my personal opinion, cannot be taken as a disadvantage. It has to be seen as an advantage. I agree that this will disrupt the balance of power because rich countries will access this technology and poor countries will have no access to it. So much like nuclear power, cyber warfare, all these emerging technologies, there's no doubt that the rich will now become even more powerful and the weak will now become even more vulnerable. But the way to address that I would say is through other alternatives like transferring technology rather than saying we need to ban this altogether. There are some people who are saying that this research needs to be banned. We can't use exoskeletons. We can't use artificial intelligence. I personally don't see that to be a sort of major, uh, 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 to be a productive way to go along. Last two points, we need to look at the role of non-state actors in this way as well. Uh, the pictures on your right there, on the slide there, so the picture on top, the Chinese authorities capture a terrorist group. Of course, we could call them Hong Kong freedom fighters if we don't agree with it, whatever. But uh, according to the Chinese government, it's a terrorist group, right? So we need to accept that. So the Chinese government apprehended a terrorist group that was using 3D printing to manufacture weapons. And the picture below that is a picture of uh, the Islamic State using drones in Syria and Iraq. So what we are clearly seeing is non-state actors 
adapting new technology even faster than some of the smaller countries do. Even, I mean, there are many countries in South America and Africa, for example, where even their own official armed forces are not using 3D printing and drone technology yet. And now we have non-state actors who are doing it. So we need to keep that in mind when we look at how this impacts the future of warfare. We need to consider the possibility of non-state actors adapting this as well. And finally, as my concluding point, I would just like to put forward a theory that what we are seeing now is a move towards individual-centric warfare. In the next 50 to 100 years, warfare will transform, once again, simply my theory, quite a sort of unrecognizably to where the role of the individual will now become far more important than before. We've already seen it now where one drone pilot sitting in the United States somewhere can wreak far more havoc in, let's say, Pakistan or Yemen than an entire contingent of troops on the ground can. So we are already seeing this move more and more towards the individual and the rise of exoskeletons in warfare, I feel, will totally cement this transformation where warfare, ta warfare tactics, maneuvers, strategy, doctrine, everything we will see changing uh, to be more geared towards an individual in the battlefield. And as far as I'm concerned, in the 21st century, that is the new normal of warfare. Thank you very much for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Chair, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nilanthan, for your very interesting presentation. This is an area we hardly talk about. However, it has the potential of, as you said, disrupting the uh, present balance of power. And also, as you said, the involvement of uh, non-state actors in uh, enhancing this technology can have very serious uh, implications. Now our next presentation is in the nuclear field. Uh, nuclear hazards of Sri Lanka, myths and realities. Now there can be two sources of uh, nuclear hazards. Uh, one is the military use of uh, nuclear weapons. Or, so, and secondly, the civilian use of nuclear power plants for energy. And this paper deals with the second aspect. It discusses the nuclear concerns of non-nuclear uh, states such as Sri Lanka. The nuclear power plants in South India are located in close proximity to Sri Lanka's north and the east. There can be nuclear accidents due to human error or organizational failures. And therefore, this paper uh, argues that non-nuclear states should be adequately prepared for such eventualities. And this is a joint paper uh, our first author is uh, Dr. Sanat Silva. He received his PhD from the Department of International Relations, University of Colombo. His PhD re research is titled Nuclear Complexities in South Asia, Sri Lanka's Nuclear Concerns Under the Nuclear Shadow. He has followed an executive uh, course on strategic communication and public diplomacy at the National Defense University, Washington. Uh, he was a fellow of the program on advanced security cooperation at the Center for Security Studies, or APCSS, uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii. He is also a member of the working group on WMD and border security affiliated to the Near East, South uh, Asia, or NISA, Center for Strategic Studies. And the second author, is Mr. Nirodha Ranasinghe. He's a scientist in nuclear and radiation physics at Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Board. He has contributed for many national events uh, and nuclear research, and also the inventor of a device for radiation measuring in Sri Lanka. He's also, uh, he's also uh, professional in electronics computing, and also he happens to be an award-winning poet and a writer. And the presentation will be made by Dr. Sanat.
Good morning to you all, respected chair, uh, the audience, uh, and uh, who are connected on cyberspace. Uh, today, my topic is actually uh, related to a human security problem that we don't talk too much in Sri Lanka. But if you listen to the deliberations yesterday, especially the deliberations of the chief guest, and uh, most of the plenary speakers at the defense sessions, they were talking about the nuclear stability in South Asia as the core issue of the stability and development, especially with regard to India and Pakistan. But I'm trying to look at it from a non-nuclear state of point of view, from specially uh, limited to the human security perspective. Uh, and the relevance is actually even though it's categorized under uh, military affairs, you know that in, in countries like Sri Lanka, it is very much relevant to military because any crisis taking place in, in countries like ours, the best human resource used for, uh, to mitigate such crisis is the military. So therefore, if we face a, a nuclear hazard in the future, it will be under the purview of military anyway. So my research problem is uh, uh, ex ex uh, unfolds like this. Even though Sri Lanka is not a nuclear weapon state, she is living next door to an emerging nuclear power, India. There is a fear that the Indian nuclear power plants located in the Coromandel coast might produce hazardous spillover effects towards northern parts of the island. Further, despite the direct hazards of the possible nuclear explosion or an accident caused by man-made or natural disaster, there are other indirect impacts that could be emerged due to the covert operations of asymmetric actors in the region. So the, the threat is twofold here. The paper discusses the possibility of a nuclear hazard that can pose a threat towards Sri Lanka's security stability and well-being in the future. So the objective of my research is to uh, do a fresh interpretation of a possible inward-bound nuclear security threat towards Sri Lanka. And the method I used have, uh, is actually the qualitative analysis based on a case, based on case studies on specially focused on Cord and Coulomb nuclear power plant. The theoretical concepts that I use is uh, defense in depth uh, that is actually uh, used uh, heavily in uh, IT field, but you know, in, in defense as well. And uh, externalities, uh, the concept of externalities used in economics. So this is Sri Lanka's nuclear environment. I don't want to harp too much on this because of the time constraint. We are governed under the Atomic Energy Act of uh, 2014, Act Number 40. And there are two major bodies that govern Sri Lanka's uh, atomic uh, environment, that is Atomic Energy Board, which is uh, conducting all the scientific nature of research and stuff, and Atomic Energy Regulatory Council, which is actually a regulatory body on licensing of any atomic uh, activity taking place in Sri Lanka. And the national policy of Sri Lanka's national uh, uh, atomic uh, or nuclear uh, handling is actually to uh, totally adhere, 101% adherence to the uh, international conventions. And Sri Lanka has been commended by the atomic, International Atomic Energy Agency on this uh, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, activities on this field. But this, this is the threat that we are facing, Sri Lanka's external nuclear environment. As you can see on the map, uh, you know, Cord and Coulomb power, power plant that is at the southernmost tip in uh, the Coromandel coast and even Kalpakam very close to Sri Lanka. And uh, Cord and Coulomb especially within the radius of 250 kilometers. So what I'm going to look at is whether this distance and whether this uh, location has a direct impact on Sri Lanka's security if something takes place. So if you take India's energy mix, uh, nuclear power has the seventh position because India has other energy uh, sources by, and Cord and Coulomb is a project which was uh, taken place under the Russian uh, and Indian collaboration which was initiated in uh, 1988, but took place in 2004 for various technical reasons. But uh, what you have to understand is nuclear is not India's uh, breadwinner in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in energy generation mix, but it will be in the future 
and India is planning to have uh, this nuclear energy as the top energy, uh, one of the top or three uh, in time to come into 2050. So that is uh, why we need to be uh, aware, uh, aware about these issues. So when they established the Coden Coulomb power plant in southernmost part of India, there were many uh, agitations going on, especially the people's movement against nuclear energy uh, headed by Dr. Uday Kumar, and he said uh, it is misleading, politically misleading people, and as well as it's a huge uh, risk. But this power plants, everything was uh, backed by a great scientist uh, of all times in our history, J.P. Abdul Kalam, he said the plant is safe in all aspects. There is no need to worry about the safety aspect of the plant as it is in low frequency seismic zone. There is no threat of a tsunami as a plant is 1,300 kilometers away from the seismic center point. Besides, the plant is 13.5 meters above sea level. So what is actually, I'm talking about the myths and realities or opinion versus facts. So what is the real threat that we are having from this. The myth is actually from Indian's point of view, uh, even though, I mean, do you know that even Sri Lanka, when we start a new project, there are so many uh, agitations going on. So many political parties, we know their existence actually are based on these type of agitations. So the myths are actually the Indian Kodan Kulam power plant from the Indian point of view of these minority groups, uh, minority uh, 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 agitators are Actually, they are telling that it's politically misleading because it's not democratic, because it's not being revealed to the public. None of the countries in the world are, are revealing these type of things to the general public because general public don't have the intellect to absorb this. And uh, uh, because it's a national project, it's, it's, not a, it's not a peripheral project. And fresh resource will be polluted because of the water sent to the uh, uh, sea. It is a very uh, big myth because uh, the radioactiveness is coming from uh, the radioactive fuel and it is intact. It never, uh, you know, contact with the coolant that you produce to the water. And the heat of the water is also not being uh, very, very hot. It is a bearable heatness, which is actually have found out now recently it's good for the marine life in, in, in the area. And the Russian uh, reactor that has been, uh, the reactor design that is used, a VVER 1000 reactor, is a third generation uh, reactor, which is very technologically very advanced. I would just tell you, uh, because for, to understand for a layman, uh, Fukushima reactor, which has a, had a problem, is a first generation reactor. But this is a third generation reactor, which is technologically very advanced and the investment is huge. So there is a very less chance of having uh, an internal design problem. The population levels exceed close to the power plant is another problem, uh, another uh, argument they bring, but that is not a very big issue because you know even if you take the power plants, they are going to, uh, they are actually building in Karachi, has huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, populations than uh, this area of, of Tamil Nadu. And there is a problem of evacuation Actually, those things are not connected to the power plant, but that should be uh, connected to the, the other, defense uh, uh, other defense structures. There may be radioactive impact already harming the people because increased cases of cancer. They are trying to connect this with the cancer. Even Sri Lankan cases are high. All over the world, the cancer cases are high. You, there is no research has been done to connect this to the cancer. The possibility of an Indian Air Force plane crash into the plant, actually there's a recent past in, for an example, in 2019, there are about 20 plane crashes of the Indian Air Force, and therefore some people say that if, I mean, there's, the, the, the rate is very high in the Indian Air Force. So therefore, if a plane crashes into this, then there'll be a problem. Actually, that is a quite a realistic, but you know, very, uh, that can be avoided. The two reactors that have been built at Coden Coulomb are, uh, have been built, uh, you know, under this uh, VVER reactors, the Russian reactors are third generation and they are located in very high levels of, uh, from the sea level. So there is no way, I mean, no, uh, scientifically, they are very safe and, and they will not be uh, subjected to any tsunami because it's a low seismic uh, area as well. 
And the reality is, is actually the environmental threat to the Gulf of Mana from the side of Sri Lanka. We have to do a research from the side of Sri Lankan scientists whether because this is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world, you know, one of the best places for biodiversity. So we had to do an in-depth in -depth research to see whether the Codon Coulomb and Kalpakam is actually changing our natural habitats. And the air pollution, if there is a leak during the times of the monsoon wind, there can be a, an impact, not an immediate impact, but a later impact on our crops if it rains on our crops later in Polonarua, Anuradhapura, those areas. This is where we get our all rice production. And then it can cause a national disaster plus human error like Fukushima, uh, because human error is always subject to, uh, I mean, a, a big component in, in case of uh, India, Sri Lanka, because of corruption, because of uh, continuity of, uh, you know, commitment, the attitudes, and there are so many problems of the people who are working there. Not all the people from the scientists, you know, from the colonel to cook, you can't, you don't know whether uh, all these people are committed in, 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 in the 100 percent manner. So there can be a problem in that way, but it's a very unlikely to happen problem. And there can be also a state attack, possibility on an escalation, escalation attack on a nuclear power plant, because if a nuclear power plant is attacked, it can actually be explored and it can cause a real danger. But this next point is the biggest point that I want to uh, uh, raise from the side of Sri Lanka because the asymmetric actors attack possibility of a 9-11 type of a plane crash or a, uh, uh, or a kind of a uh, terrorist attack because you know, we are generating a lot of terrorists now. I mean, whether we like it or not, we have to uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that because in, in New Zealand, in other places of the world, and even in uh, Syria, everywhere we get, uh, you know, uh, these fundamentalists, you know, they have somehow, uh, it's not a state that is involved in it, but, you know, the, pri uh, the, the asymmetric actors are present in Sri Lankan soil. So, therefore, it is a perfect, it makes a perfect target for them to attack India and Sri Lanka at the same time and the whole region at the same time. So we have to be aware of that. So this map shows that also in 2014-15, uh, how many attacks that have been taken place, you know, the yellow colored, it's the nuclear facilities and the bases of possible nuclear capable bases. So the red are the accidents of uh, terrorist attacks and transportation, uh, and also blue terror attacks in 2015 and green all terror attacks in 2014. So you can see there are so many terrorist involvement in taking place, but the defense in depth only talking about the facility, but it should talk about the environment as well. So that's my argument. So finally, I recommend Sri Lankan government should take preventive measures. It's a must to have a nuclear intelligence unit and uh, and to partnering with Indian defense because we should we should tell them there is a problem because it's easily cross uh, area of this Gulf of Mana there you can actually pose a threat to Indian side and we have a the government has a responsibility to protect our people and in Sri Lanka's disaster preparedness plan doesn't have a nuclear preparedness as a component at least the district plans of Mana and Jaffna should have this as their uh, priorities Continuous awareness of the threat is a must because we only have about 100 doctors who can deal uh, in such a disaster. So I think especially the Army, Navy and the Air Force should uh, properly be equipped about it and, and improve their capacity on this. More training programs, drills and uh, we should aim for the CBR and ready community. So that's my presentation. Thank you everybody for your uh, Patience listening, thanks. Dr. Sanat Silva, thank you very much for that uh, very useful presentation. Uh, as he said, uh, we should have a nuclear preparedness plan and, and also CBRN community. Actually, unlike uh, corona, the radiation can spread very rapidly. Uh, therefore, preparedness is necessary. Some people say that we should have a MOU or a memorandum of understanding with India. 
about how to uh, face that kind of situation. But anyway, preparedness is better than anything else. So our, our ne uh, next presentation is uh, on securitizing the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, this paper looks at COVID-19 experience from a perspective of security studies. There has been a substantial military involvement in Sri Lanka in responding to non-traditional uh, security threats. Taking COVID as a case study, this paper addresses various issues relating to military engagement in responding to COVID-19 experience. And uh, this paper is presented by Colonel Tusita Bandara. He is a senior military officer presently serving at the Ministry of Defense. He completed his Master of Arts in International Relations from the University of Colombo, Master of Strategic, Study, uh, Strategic and Defense Studies from the University of Kalania, and Master of Human Rights and uh, Human Rights from the University of Colombo, and a postgraduate diploma in Strategic uh, Studies and uh, from the University of Malaya. Uh, presently, he is reading for his MPhil PhD program at the KDU. So let me call upon uh, Mr. Tusita Bandara to make his presentation on uh, military combating an invisible enemy, uh, securitizing the COVID-19 uh, in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, for your kind introduction, Your Honorable Chair. Distinguished faculty members, fellow speakers, members of the learned audience, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. At the outset, let me thank the KDU for giving me this opportunity to present my paper in the 14th session of the International Research Conference of the KDU. Let me also congratulate the KDU for successful conduct of the research conference. Today, I'll be presenting on the topic of combating an invisible enemy securitizing the COVID-19 threat in Sri Lanka. Let me get on with the presentation proper. Through the declaration of COVID-19 outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern by the WHO, many state started mobilizing certain level of military resources to wide variety of roles in their national response mechanism. In many parts of the world, despite mounting criticism, armed forces are also deployed to enforce law and order operations in support of COVID-19 prevention efforts. Notwithstanding the Sri Lankan military executing an extensive role, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented considerable challenges and extensive system-wide impacts across a society. Policy responses have grown out beyond health intervention in which the assistance of the armed forces to the healthcare sector has increased tremendously in the National Action Plan. However, many health sector professionals, opposition political party members, NGOs, some ordinary people underscore the extensive military effort in the national response to the pandemic. With that, the objective of my paper is to examine wide range in engagements of the military in COVID-19 crisis in relation to the concept of securitization. The government of Sri Lanka approach in combating COVID-19 has been a whole of government approach. The government had taken proactive measures well before the pandemic hit Sri Lanka through establishment of a National Action Committee for COVID-19. The government had taken uh, these measures well before, that is in uh, year 2020. The Sri Lankan Armed Forces were formally inducted into the COVID-19 response in mid-March 2020. The President uh, he himself had set up a National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak led by Commander of the Army to execute combined operations of combating COVID-19. The Sri Lankan approach broadly focused on four lines of operation and they are military, police, intelligence line of operation, which is an exclusively intelligence driven operation that contributes to detecting the origin of the virus, identify the vulnerable communities, potential contaminations and prevents the spreading through mobility. Then the second line is medical and healthcare line of operation. This is designed for early detection, isolation and provides treatment by contact tracing through primary healthcare staff. 
The next line of operation is the psychological line of operation. This is to address the perceptive sphere of the community by providing COVID-19 related factual information in the country and the world. The last one is the economy and well-being of the community line of operation, which is to sustenance of the country's economy while safeguarding the immediate well-being of the population. Although different line of operations were premeditated for various stakeholders, it was evident that the military was performing all type of operation and at times laid in other line of operations as well. Therefore, many critics claim that the coronavirus counter strategy has been highly militarized and politicized. And there is a more deceptive and deep lasting impact of extensive military engagement in health issues. In Sri Lanka, the military is an instrument of national power of the state, safeguarding territorial integrity, sovereignty, and securing people from military threats. However, they could be employed for secondary role, commonly known as military operations other than war, such as to counter non-traditional security threats as an instrument of last resort or in extreme emergencies. In other words, the Sri Lankan military role should be seen through the lens of traditional security. And pandemics, infection outbreaks are traditionally the purviews of the public health professionals and the medical community of Sri Lanka. At theoretical or conceptual platform, if health issues have become a traditional security threat, then it would be rational to anticipate that the military should bear key responsibility in fighting the virus. The primary, the military has enormous assets, developed skills, proficiency to operate under traumatic circumstances. The method of operating, hierarchical and top-down command structure has led to enable the rapid decision making which facilitate to overcome delays through cutting red tapes. The armed forces have demonstrated a trend to lead the crisis management mechanisms. Excessive scale military employment in non-traditional security may disturb civilian control and civilian rights, given that the military follows chain of command and consider lawbreakers as enemies. According to many critics, Dependency on armed forces involvement in response to COVID-19 may challenge resourceless civilian control or may lead to promote military control. Moreover, there can be negative repercussions on the armed forces when deployed excessively in non-traditional security for a protracted period. Operational readiness would seriously weaken by the COVID-19 outbreak and related outcomes. Thus, it would substantially undermine the traditional responsibility of the armed forces. The COVID-19 pandemic has been located within the security discourse and has been securitized given the fact that the language used for COVID-19 infers that the virus is a threat. The notion of securitization demonstrates that the Sri Lankan response to the COVID-19 comprised all the critical elements that are required for securitization. That is shown on the screen. The securitization concept narrates to redefine a variety of non-traditional security subject matters of security. Accordingly, several subjects of national interest are placed under the classification of national security at the conceptual level. Practically, securitization is mainly used to legitimize the state to use extraordinary measures, including military, to increase the public sense of urgency. In the case of the securitization of COVID-19 issue in Sri Lanka, political leaders have outlined the existential threat of COVID-19 as a national security threat from its early stages. And thus, the government of Sri Lanka became the securitization actor. Public acceptance of the COVID-19 threat was very responsive, considering its seriousness. As a process of legitimacy, the Sri Lankan government has initiated several measures. When the military forces of the other countries stepped into the crisis as an instrument of last resort, the Sri Lankan armed forces adopted a different approach with an increased level of involvement in the COVID-19 crisis. Many nations employed the armed forces to fulfill auxiliary logistic tasks to relieve the burden on overwhelmed civilian agencies in their countries. In Sri Lanka, however, the security forces took lead in all in the COVID-19 crisis management from day one as well as performing tasks that are usually executed by public health professionals, which include, the, include uh, heading the national campaign by military leaders. Therefore, response to the COVID-19 health crisis demonstrated 
securitization, not simply in conceptual terms, but mainly in practical terms. To conclude my presentation, the term security has broadened to include many non-traditional threats into security discourse. Accordingly, political authority have referred COVID-19 health crisis as a threat where extraordinary measures, including employment of military, were legitimized with the acceptance of population at large. The effects were correspondingly advantageous and also problematic. The increased awareness has facilitated resources to be mobilized to address the deteriorating health situation in Sri Lanka. However, this advantage was overshadowed by several inappropriate responses of the COVID-19 securitization inspires. A country like Sri Lanka with medical resource constraints need alternative options to augment the medical or health sector when dealing with extreme cases that may lead to securitized responses. The unwarranted employment of armed forces to substitute other sectors has generated undesirable consequences escalating the crisis. Military commanders leading the national health response mechanism have less flexibility where the probability of deviation or challenge to the political decision remains marginal due to military discipline and also according to the organizational culture. That leads to a rigorous response but threatens people rights and community reliance. However, this study identified that these employment of options facilitated military to expand their operational environment, remain relevant, increase their social standing, and support societies with their expertise. In the end, the findings suggest that justifiable employment of military in non-traditional security will allow for improved social resilience amidst the pandemic and future crisis responses. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Bandara for that uh, presentation with a lot of insights. There are misconceptions about the military involvement. Uh, however, you explain some of the reasons for these misconceptions, which are mostly unfounded. And uh, our next presentation is also on a very interesting topic. Uh, is the German Blitzkrieg military strategy a feasible tactic in modern day warfare. Now this paper attempts to discuss whether it is feasible to adopt and improvise the traditional blitz, blitzkrieg uh, strategy and tactics to modern warfare. The writer has discussed multiple developments which have taken place uh, in the recent past uh, to the traditional German blitzkrieg strategy and he argues that this is a very useful area for further research. Uh, let me call upon, uh, it, is, it is presented by uh, Rashne, uh, Rashen J. Pinto. Uh, Rashen is an undergraduate at Victoria University, Melbourne, and Gern American University, Cyprus, reading for a bachelor's degree in financial risk management and international relations, respectively. Uh, he is the vice secretary at Sri Lanka chapter of the students for the exploration and development of space, and the co-founder of the university chapter of the same organization at the National School of Business Management. He is also the United Nations student ambassador, coordinator for the sustainable development goals at NSBM. And he's also an experienced chess player. Uh, and um, he writes articles for a multiple of local newspapers on topics relating to terrorism, peace, and the status quo of the political attributes in both Sri Lanka and foreign aspects. And uh, now let me call upon uh, Rashen J. Pinto to make his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, go ahead. All right. Uh, so good morning, Honorable Chair, Professor Emeritus uh, Amal Jayavardhana, panel of experts, fellow distinguished researchers, and all guests present here today. So I'm Rashe and Jude Pinto, and uh, the topic of my research paper is, is the German Blitzkrieg military strategy a feasible tactic in modern day warfare? 
so the research problem to my research paper is the same as its topic then to start off with a brief introduction as to what my research paper is i've conducted a comprehensive analysis into what the blitzkrieg strategy is and what it entails i've also identified a plethora of various challenges to the implementation of the blitzkrieg strategy in modern day combat scenarios i've also made evaluations as to how combat and warfare have revolutionized since the end of the second world war i've also attempted to provide a series of policy recommendations as to how developments can be made to proponents of the blitzkrieg strategy in order to increase its effectiveness in modern day combat uh, the methodology that i've used are both uh, primary as well as secondary sources so to start off with defining as to what exactly blitzkrieg is so basically it is a military doctrine that was first adopted by adolf hitler and uh, reichsmarsch and heis guderian of the uh, german military during the second world war it was designed to deliver a swift and focused blow towards the enemy through rapidly moving conventional forces including armored mechanized and motorized infantry divisions as well as with close local air support now nazi germany exploited this concentrated armored force to effectively spearhead their way across allied defense lines across europe and this enabled adolf hitler to swiftly and collectively invade most of western europe within a matter of a few months so some of the research questions that are identified it in my research paper are as follows firstly i have attempted to identify as to how conventional warfare has revolutionized since the end of the second world war secondly i have attempted to identify the various challenges to the implementation of the traditional blitzkrieg strategy in modern day combat thirdly i have attempted to identify and uh, provide a series of policy recommendations as to how the blitzkrieg strategy could be used in 21st century combat in line with my research questions are my research objectives which are of uh, similar interest during the course of my research i identified five major challenges to the implementation of the traditional discrete strategy in modern combat firstly differences in terrain when adolf hitler used the blitzkrieg strategy he was given the wide terrain the wide european terrain and open fields of europe but however this is not the case in other regional battlegrounds across the world for example if we take the sri lankan war against terrorism the momentum and rapid movement that is needed by the blitzkrieg strategy could not be obtained in uh, the dense forest of the vanni or in the eastern or in the bans of the eastern province therefore it's not feasible in all battlegrounds across the world secondly the issue with modern anti tank weapons and tactics one of the key problems in terms of the usage of tanks is the rocket propelled grenade or the rpg when during the sri lankan war against terrorism the ltte used the rpg very robustly and they used it to penetrate the frontal armor of the t55 main battle tanks of the sri lankan armored corps this was followed by other anti tank uh, tactics such as suicide bombing and so on next we've got tactical nuclear capabilities the key to uh, the blitzkrieg strategy is a concentrated force of armored mechanized and motorized infantry divisions however these are of no match to the sheer force and energy that is detonated through nuclear blasts moreover we've got the hindrances to achieving air superiority in the blitzkrieg strategy close local air support and air superiority is key however multiple hindrances are are existent to the to achieving this air superiority across the world such as again the rpg or surface to air missiles air to air missiles as well as high altitude defense systems such as the united states uh, tard system or the russian s400 then we have informationized warfare artificial intelligence quantum computing cloud computing big data analytics and as well as quantum information have become focal points of 21st century warfare especially in terms of countries such as china and therefore these are, these cannot be combated by a force concentration of armored motorized and mechanized infantry divisions 
more or other other uh, aspects of informationized war also include the information warfare such as the propaganda campaigns that are disseminated by ltt terrorist front organizations overseas or radical ideological expansion such as the salafi bahavist uh, islamist extremist ideologies etc so some of the core findings in my research are that the key proponents in the mix of the 1939 and 1945 blitzkrieg strategy have remained the same the proponents have remained the same however the mix in itself has changed and this has changed vastly so some of the proponents that are identified during the course of my research are as follows first of all as i've discussed previously air superiority now the proponents of air superiority have remained the same throughout however the mix is different for example if we take a historical perspective during the arab israeli six day war in 1967 the israelis used something called operation focus in order to achieve air superiority or we could take the gulf war where the us led coalition dropped more than 88000 tons of bombs through more than 100000 air sorties against the iraqi forces of saddam hussein in order to gain air superiority moreover they also the united states led coalition they also bombed the iraqi radar sites using their h64 apache helicopters as well as they used more than 100 adm 145 uh, tald decoy missiles in order to confuse the high altitude defense systems available to saddam hussein so these have been aspects uh, regarding to air superiority then we have shock action do in my research paper i have spoken extensively uh, in terms of operation uh, bhumikampa which was uh, an operation that the sri lankan armed co used against the ltt terrorists where they destroyed the mathagal sea tiger base near palali airport in jaffna and the immense uh, sheer force of the t55 main battle tanks of eight t55 main battle tanks of the sri lankan armed co rushing towards the ltte position in uh, mathagal the sheer force destroyed the terrorist will to stand and fight and multiple terrorists ran back into the jungles and fled this is the concept of shock action then of course strong communication is needed for any battlefield across the world and of course in the sri lankan war against terrorism uh, both sri lankan forces as well as the ltte terrorists have uh, continually in, indulged in uh, methods to jam the communications of one another lastly we've got developments made against anti war anti tank strategies such as the existence of the explosive reactive armor which is being uh, installed onto the uh, frontal and back of uh, main battle tanks as well as i've spoken uh, extensively about what the sri lankan armor core did in order to uh, compromise the rpgs rpg usage by the ltte they used an iron mesh onto the frontal armor of our main battle tanks which i have ex uh, explained extensively therefore in conclusion to my presentation the concept of the blitzkrieg strategy is built on an array of proponents that were discussed uh, previously in my presentation and these proponents are well sorted out in modern day combat scenarios however the manner in which these proponents are addressed are vastly revolutionized on uh, depending on various attributes such as the type of warfare level of technology uh, differences in enemy uh, terrain compatibility etc contextualized analysis of the attributes such as uh, level of anti tank weapons available to the enemy nuclear capabilities uh, relevance of air superiority type of warfare need to be taken into account in order to get the best and most effective results in terms of the adaptation of the blitzkrieg strategy in modern day combat before i uh, conclude i would like to express my sincere gratitude and acknowledgement to brigadier shrimudan nayaka from the sri lanka armed co and senior fellow of the institute of national security studies for his continued support during the course of my research so thank you everyone have a nice day well thank you very much uh, mr rashen pinto for that uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation and i i think you have selected a very important area for your research at the uh, victoria university and uh, our next presentation is also a very interesting area 
that is uh, automated assassins, utility drones as suicide carders in modern warfare. Now, usually it is the human beings who have acted as uh, suicide bombers on various occasions. But in the recent past, a situation has risen that drones have been used as, su uh, su uh, as su suicide uh, caders, uh, carders. This paper argues that this threat needs more attention as a national security priority in a rapidly advancing technological era. Uh, this presentation uh, is done by DCN Hapuarachi. Uh, Major DCN Hapuarachi is from the 14th Rocket Regiment in Sri Lanka Artillery. He followed electrical and electronic engineering degree in KDU intake 28. He was a member of the project of smart and automated fire and power monitoring system. And uh, it was presented in IEE 8th International Conference on Industrial and Information Systems in 2013. Uh, it's over to you, Major Hapuarachi. I think, uh, yeah, he will be making the presentation. He won't be physically present, but uh, his presentation will appear on screen. Thank you. Utility of drones as suicide carders in modern warfare. Oh. As Mary Carl explained in her book, New, New and All was effect of globalization have exacerbated the local conflicts between states and within states over civilization issues. She further emphasized that the new uh, political phenomena generated by the end of the Cold War and globalization of economics and communications due to the new technological advancements have enhanced the complexity of the conflicts. With such information of nature of conflict, especially due to mobilization and technological advancements, deliverance and opponents adopt novel tactics such as utility of flying drones and advanced weaponry to meet the ends. Therefore, within such a techno transformation of the world, we are aware this research emphasizes the utility of drones substituting suicide cards and the danger mounting in modern warfare. This research is based on a qualitative research methodology, especially utilizing the case study analysis as a method. These opponents such as terrorists are free from the uh, international laws and boundaries, adhere to a variety of tactics which can vary from simple to complex and they can also differ from conventional to unconventional. However, these eccentric tactics are preserved by the government officials and experts as serious potential coercion. Suicide terrorism is considered as the most destructive form of all unconventional tactics of terrorism which deter the opponent sometimes at the expense of the losing support among terrorists on community. As Robert De Pepe has explained in his article, Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism. The difference of suicide terrorism is to other attacks is that the success of attack is measured by the death of the attacker. The danger of the modern warfare is that with the advancements in technology, instead of a person who is willing to carry the bomb can be replaced by the fine drone. Even if this requires sufficient expert, the investment in this world differs due to the accuracy, non-human environment without being captured in Islam. Yemen's air Houthi. Al Houthi terror groups on 14 September 2019 has claimed responsibility over the drone strike and instead drone Saudi oil processing facility at Abqai. Looking at how drones have been utilized by terror groups such as Al Houthi movement substituting suicide mission, it is evident that this problem has become a mountain danger, mountain danger to the security atmosphere. However, this problem has not been recognized by the states. Therefore, this trade and needs more attention as an in, uh, in national security priority in rapidly enhanced technology and environment. Objectives. First questions. The core argument of the finding of this research is based on four case studies. Peninsula President, President Nicholas, drone association attack on 4th, 4th August 2018. While President addressing the 81st anniversary of the country's National Guard attack carried out with two drones that carried explosives. 
first don't detonate in the air then few second later second don't crash into the apartment block at the apkai oil processing facility on saudi arabia on 14 september 2019 the apkai is the world largest oil processing facility 25 drones and missiles were used in this attack in two waves that led images of apkai oil facility shows the 19 injury strikes among them 14 were punched in the oil tank attack on jambu air force station 27 june 2021 The bomb was dropped by the drones on hit on the roof of the signal single single story building at the technical area of the airport. Other one was on the ground. ISIS dropped two IEDs on the Syrian army ammunition depot in a stadium on October in 2017 in Israel. Large number of drones component found by the forces when occupied the IS building. Those hardware and electronics items were matching. those by commercial drones this says that i is trying to build the or modify drones that commercially available it is revealed that the islamic state has used drones for the different purposes such as for the imagery and propping of bombs in that case substituting suicide carders with the drone could have been a possibility in the battle of uh, field of is however this assumption needs further research what i wanted to highlight is terrorist groups like is has also favored the drone technology had as been used Used for the different purposes. Suicide bombing is not a few, uh, new strategy that has been used by terrorists. They use some techniques like ramming airplanes into building, car bomb, suicide jacket, like that. But when implementing these all methods, they have used to utilize the individual or group of individuals to do that task. It takes time to groom suicide car. It is definitely time to con- time consuming, and also you have to deal a lot of. Lot with the feeling of the individual, because radicalization it is itself is process. Even if you convince the individual, there is still uncertainty of whether the person will change his or her mind in the last minute. Therefore, grooming of the suicide car takes time. Additionally, there is a high risk of compromise of the entire organization or the mission of the suicide car if by any chance he or she get caught to the security forces. However, utility of drone among the terrorists have become more popular, especially due to its ability to reach the target with less obstacles. Also, drone can be programmed to the task at the exact time without any delay and human errors. Most important thing is that terrorist groups can save the physical strength to fight without using suicide as suicide as a tool to meet their strength. It also makes them. Look more sophisticated in the style of attack. The use of drones can sometimes build confidence. These are the some of reasons why terrorists use by drones substituting suicide terrorists. To avoid this kind of drone attack, most of the countries use drone detection system and drone neutralization system. Mainly, there are four ways to detect drones. Those are the radio frequency, optic, radar, and acoustic. states also adapt active or passive account the measures to address this threat depending on the nature of it some countries like usa france uae japan and australia bring drone and their operators then operators under some sort of the government control implementing regulation Having said that, also there are countries who have not taken this threat into serious consideration, and majority of the countries fall into this category. They have argued that the fear to drone you need with specific skill, expertise, and also finance. Therefore, they have assumed that the trader group do not have the capability to create the manufactured drones. However, it has been identified that terrorists purchase the drones from the online websites, mainly from China, and make it deliver to their home or host country, where there is no necessity for do them the manufacture. It by themselves. Drone manufacturing companies like DJI is considered as the prime supplier of the drones of, of to the world. However, the, this company adhered to the Syria import laws, especially related to the Middle East. However, the Al Houthi knows the Jashia's military group drones into the Yemen through the border of the Israel and Egypt. The Chinese has excelled in this industry since the drones are cheap. Additionally, most of the drones purchased from via via internet from the online market places like Hobbykin, drone maker AliExpress, and drone parts, which depict the idea that it is being purchased to fulfill the hobby or for commercial purposes. Yet there is no way to understand the intention of the purchase in this initial stage. Furthermore, DJI is still using the full 
put much of Iraq and Syria to the list of geofence and no-fly zones in 2017 caught that prevent flying over at the critical location. However, the software barrier was eventually broken. When it comes to the attack on Saudi Arabian Abqai oil, or oil processing complex, the country missile defense system failed to hold its arm of draws. At least one MIM-104 Patriot missile defense system is stationed in Abqai. This missile system, on the other hand, is, is intended, intended for the high altitude target. This research finally emphasizes on the four factors to reduce the threat of drone substituting suicide targets. It is important to establish high sensitivity drone detection system with the couple with the drone information system in the key establishment like power plant, military installations, airports. Publish maximum technical specification of drones that can be used for public, public for hobby and commercial purpose in country. Train and induct platoons with the drone utilization gun for VIP and VVIP cross security. Most importantly, border. Security and law enforcement should be enhanced to prevent the unwanted individual or organization purchase drones for the harmful activities. Drone centers must have, must have obtained security clearance. With the technological advancement after the Cold War, the security aspects of the countries have changed simultaneously. The terrorists used by the technology has also enhanced. It has made the current warfare complex and lethal. Within such a country, the duty of substituting of drones with the suicide terrorist attacks have gained momentum to due to its cost benefit factor and the accuracy of the target, among many other reasons. However, even if countries have implemented certain measures to avoid drones being used for harmful reasons, still there is a gap in existing security strategies. Hence, this research emphasizes on the terrorist use of drones, substituting it with suicide terrorism and the importance of the considering this phenomenon as a national security threat. Major Hapuarachi, thank you very much for your very interesting and detailed presentation. I think you discussed only one, one aspect. Uh, it appears that even it not only non-state actors, but even state actors uh, are resorting to the use of drones to attack their targets. Thank you very much. And uh, our next presentation is on civil military interdependency to counter terrorism, a case study of Sri Lanka. Now, countering or preventing violent extremism is a multifaceted uh, phenomenon, and there are many ways to do that. This paper advocates the idea of building a bridge between military and local communities, creating an information highway by having better relationship or strong nexus between the military and the civil society, intelligence gathering could be broad based and the cooperation of the civil society can be obtained in countering terrorism. And uh, he argues that uh, civil society should be made the stakeholder um, in this exercise. And this is a joint paper uh, by uh, H.S. Vijay Singh and Mr. M. Ajwad. Now, Hiranta Sandalu Vijay Singh is currently reading for his Master's in Security and Strategic Studies at the Faculty of Graduate Studies, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University, and Master's in Conflict and Peace Studies at the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Management and a diploma in international relations. Hiranta has 10 years of experience in the fields of corporate training and general administration. His major research interests include intelligence, counterterrorism, and maritime so uh, security. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Ajwad is currently reading for his master, master of Science in Security and Strategic Studies at the Faculty of Graduate Studies at KDU. He has worked as a senior security engineer and at King Fahd International Airport, Saudi Arabia. He holds various internationally recognized certifications related to airport security systems from United States and participation in many seminars in this field. Now, can I call upon Mr. Vijay Singh, Hiranta Vijay Singh to make this presentation? It's over to you. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
can you see my uh, presentation sir yes we can see okay uh, thank you chair for the uh, introduction and uh, honorable chair professor amarja wardana ladies and gentlemen uh, good morning to all of you first of all i would like to thank uh, the organizing committee of the 14th uh, international research conference for giving me this opportunity to present at this uh, prestigious event and i'm uh, truly honored to present you uh, today uh, so the topic for this session would be the civil military interdependence to counter terrorism and this uh, study is co-authored uh, by my colleague uh, mohammad ajwar uh, so uh, to introduce you the problem uh, first uh, we all know that three decades of brutal terrorism and ethnic violence uh, which crippled uh, sri lanka's economy and uh, social structure in, ended in uh, the year 2009 uh, however a, a decade of peace was uh, shattered by the east sunday attacks in 2019 uh, since then uh, sri lankan military and law enforcement authorities have been increasingly tasked with uh, preventing responding and investigating these extremist movements uh, so in the changing security context of sri lanka we can foresee that uh, ethnic uh, separatism and uh, religious extremism being a very significant security threat in the future uh, so due to these unsettled religious extremism issues uh, during the recent past uh, some radical extremists have been encouraged to uh, form groups to resort violence by marginalizing the moderates of the same religion or the ethnic group uh, finally one of these groups carried out the easter sunday attack on 21st april 2019 and the greater challenge is that uh, these terrorists are hidden from the eyes of the security forces as they live in the society among the people so information not being shared due to lack of cooperation between the authorities and the civil society can be seen as one major threat to uh, national security so this demands uh, authorities to establish a system of public participation in counter terrorism and in order to do that military must work closely with their communities which they serve in by developing new techniques and collaborate with new people while nurturing their public trust Uh, the main objective of this uh, study was to provide necessary recommendations on a comprehensive framework uh, to counter terrorism by establishing a system of uh, public participation and uh, to outline the importance of uh, civil military interdependency in order to create an information uh, highway so this research is based on the qualitative data derived from uh, first hand accounts and secondary sources and it uh, provides an in depth analysis on the human intelligence and its importance to the current context importance in information sharing and civil military interdependency and the importance of building trust and positive relationship with the community and this study draws two lessons from two uh, sri lankan community experiences and the conclusion provides suggestions to build a better relationship among the military and the civil society Uh, so moving on to the literature uh, and discussion uh, according to turner intelligence is a crucial component in uh, defeating terrorism and it is the first step in preventing terrorist activities and more importantly it is the process of uh, obtaining information about the terrorists and their operations and in intelligence uh, several uh, disciplines are used by the military to acquire information uh, which are broadly categorized into human intelligence Uh, open source intelligence and technical intelligence and bonus says that out of the above human intelligence uh, which comes directly from the human is the most important and the most valuable intelligence function as it is very accurate and also very timely uh, then we are going to uh, speak about building trust building trust is also very important when using uh, human intelligence and plays a vital role when it comes to building effective relationships and human intelligence received through interpersonal contacts uh, built on trust and according to kernel uh, military is facing a lot of challenges in engaging with local communities due to this lack of trust component so by building trust civil society will show greater faith and confidence in the engagement with the military and security activities therefore building trust is very important in creating an information highway using the civil society uh, travel states that uh, shared information 
information can improve the quality of intelligence and uh, day to day activities that happen in the society may have a connection to a terrorist network and a single piece of information that comes from the community could be the key to the military investigations uh, communities may have very vulnerable informa valuable information uh, but uh, without a good a trusted relationship and a proper system to coordinate this information uh, sharing information is very limited uh, and the, the 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 authorities has to understand the importance of such mutual trust to create the civil military interdependency however uh, controlling the quality of intelligence received uh, the quality of information uh, received by the community is very challenging task so uh, if we if we take the east attacks uh, which happened 2 years ago before the attack there were few civilians who provided reasonable information regarding these uh, extremist groups and uh, its development and about their ideologies uh, so months before his attack uh, uh, mohammad taslim a social worker of Maavan, from mawanalla had been at the forefront of efforts to investigate these extremist movements his information and the coordination with the authorities led to raid Uh, in Vanata Villa of Putla, where a large number of explosives, uh, explosives and chemicals were uh, found, and Taslim's story shows us uh, how the civil society actively trying to stop the emerging radical elements, uh, which happens within their community, and also religious leader Mufti Muhammad Rizvi, who testified before the uh, Select Committee for Easter Sunday attacks, uh, stated that he had provided information on the emerging extremist movements and ideologies to authorities. so therefore the information uh, from this community is uh, very important to combat terrorism and they were able to identify the extremist behavior and ideology within their uh, own community so so um, uh, when we talk about the recommendations of this uh, study establishment of a civil joint task force is the main recommendation we would like to present a civil joint task force uh, will act as a, a terrorist early warning group and this task force is a well structured entity consisting members from the local community uh, and they they will be operate in a, a well organized manner and this team uh, includes uh, the religious leaders of the society retired military officers intellectuals youth uh, social workers from the community and 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 these groups uh, will uh, engage with the local society and uh, this using these kind of uh, uh, civilians enables Uh, them to identify the changes happening in their own society so that will be a early warning if the ideologies or the movements uh, are happening uh, also it helps in identifying social and economic problems within the society because these are uh, crucial human security factors that motivate vulnerable individuals to engage in terrorist activity and also proper recruitment and selection need to be taken place to ensure the effectiveness of these operations and the loyalty of the members is also very important as the security of the information is very important and uh, uh, has to be uh, the information has to be shared in real time and uh, we suggest that every administrative region in sri lanka should have uh, a coordinated uh, civilian uh, uh, group like a early warning group um, uh, in the society uh, then the other one next will be the community building and education the military can bridge the gap uh differences through volunteerism and community relations and education can be one main way which the military can get involved and the additional hours military put in their uh, put in their, uh, put in their community work keeps the bond between the society and the military uh, which eventually can eventually improve the security and the social links between the military and civil society will lead to a more stable friendly and confident relationship with the both parties and these kind of activities uh, are very important because uh, they can keep the youth in the society that military serve uh, out of trouble and prevents getting involved in the terrorist activities so no doubts uh, are admitting that information obtained from the civil society or the local communities is more essential and it is necessary to introduce policies to deal with the most important part uh, of countering terrorism and lack of cooperation can be seen as one major reason for information not being shared and uh, sri lanka military should, should establish uh, better relations with the local communities in which they operate 
and also military can bridge the differences through the volunteerism and community relations. Uh, cooperation among local community uh, communities of, is of utmost uh, importance when promoting counterterrorism. And also, like educational institutes like uh, General Sir John Kotala Defense University, has an important role in developing the the, the civil military um, uh, relation in Sri Lanka. And the military and the civilians here at this university receive the opportunity to interact, uh, get connected, and produce knowledge like we do. Uh, and research through, through uh, such uh, education channels. So, th so this uh, uh, institutes like this create a tendency in both the civil and military mindset that they could trust and uh, work together in achieving the national security objectives of Sri Lanka. And this could also be expanded by introducing uh, domestic preparedness programs for civilians, uh, terrorism awareness programs, first responder training programs to educate the civilians in understanding the basics on threats and how to act against it. Uh, so with this, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. And um, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Dean, lecturers, and the staff of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, uh, and also my colleagues of my uh, batch seven of Masters and uh, Strategic Studies. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Hirant Vijay Singh and uh, Mohammed Ajwad uh, for that presentation, uh, for, for, pre for presenting a very, very important concept. And I'm sure there will be questions about the logistics of implementing this idea. And uh, now it's time for questions, and the floor is open to questions. And I, I see there are several questions already. Uh, this question, the first question is to Dr. Sanath. What are the measures which are taken by Sri Lanka to avoid environmental pollution caused by nuclear wastage? Any particular policies available? Uh, actually, there's, in terms of nuclear waste, India is having a closed nuclear cycle. So that means India's nuclear waste is not being dumped in the sea. So therefore, we don't have a problem for nuclear waste generated from the Kodan Coulomb or Kalpakam uh, or any power plants in India because they have the technology to reuse them. So closed fuel cycle means it is within the Indian territory because India manages it within Indian territory without putting it anywhere. So they don't dump like, uh, you know, for an example, in the US, they use the Yucca Mountain to dump the nuclear waste. But in Indian case, India reuses them. And for what they reuse is another problem, but we don't want to talk about it now. Secondly, the nuclear substance that we have in Sri Lanka, we have about a very few kilos of uh, uranium that we use as for other purposes like uh, food processing and medical purposes. Yes, uh, we have a monitoring center uh, run by the STF and that is being centrally monitored. There are 14 places centrally monitored and well-trained uh, staff to handle those and 24 hours monitoring is taken place and all the uh, transportation in the country is being taken care by the STF. And the other thing that you need to uh, be very careful about is the medical usage of the substance in Sri Lanka. Technically, the, the X-ray machines and stuff, which emits a lot of radioactivity, should have some kind of, uh, you know, I mean, technically, they should be re-exported to the place where, where they came from. But whether it, is whether it is happening in Sri Lanka is a problem yet. But so far, no major incidents taken place. But in India, there were incidents called Mayapur incident, which was uh, actually a radioactive uh, machine has been sold to the market by the physics department uh, of uh, the University of Delhi. So this is, these are the people who know the subjects who have sold it to the scrap metal. So that type of a thing may occur in Sri Lanka, but so far, we are very good, actually, Sri Lanka's domestic nuclear security environment is perfect, actually. 
we are being commended by the IAEA and that's why we are given this monitoring system by the IAEA uh, to the STF headquarters in, uh, not headquarters, actually the Katukurun, the, you know, they have a monitoring, monitoring place. So therefore, there is no threat from the sea dumping so far. But the only thing is the waste don't mix up the, the hot water that is used for coolant as the coolant water being released to the sea by uh, the Coden Coulomb power plants. Those are actual water, no, con no, no radiation in that because they are not, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the radiation fuel rods and everything is intact. They are not connected to water. So therefore, there's no such uh, huge threat uh, or in, in waste uh, as, as uh, happening in other countries. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, now there is another question to Mr. Rashen Pinto. Can you elaborate further on what developments can be made against the anti-tank weapons and tactics? Rashen? Right, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, so, as I've discussed, I've discussed this extensively in the course of my research paper. So, uh, now there is a major, there are major anti-tank weapons and tactics that have been compromised through an array of developments made against these weapons and tactics. So, the first of all, it's the explosive reactive armor. Now, in uh, 2008, the Russians, they unveiled the RPG-30 which is a rocket propel grenade, which is the newest generation of the rocket propel grenade, which is able to penetrate even the frontal armors of uh, the United States, third generation, MIA, Abrams tank. So now the explosive reactive armor are, are reacti explosive uh, pods that are being installed on the frontal and back sides of the tank. So when the rocket propel, propel grenade hits this explosive armor, the hot jet is being diverted through this explosive. So that, that's one of the main uh, anti-tank developments made against the anti-tank uh, weapons. Secondly, uh, the Sri Lankan Armoured Corps during the Sri Lankan war against terrorism, they partnered with private companies in Colombo and designed a specialized mesh. And this mesh was welded, welded into the frontal armour of the T-55 main battle tanks in Sri Lanka with a standoff distance. So now when the RPG attempts to penetrate the frontal armor of the T-55 main battle tank, it hits this iron mesh. And uh, since it is a uh, explosive when it impacts on ex when uh, it impacts, when it explodes, when it impacts, uh, the RPG detonates when it touches the mesh. And therefore, the level of uh, destruction that the RPG can give has been severely compromised due, due to the standoff distance between the iron mesh and the actual frontal armor of the main battle tank. So this is one of the main examples that the Sri Lankan Armoured Co. Uh, took during the Sri Lankan war against terrorism. Then we have uh, composite armor, so novel developments to, the, to counter these anti-tank strategies and techniques was to manufacture of composite armor. So instead of using the traditional steel alone, the militaries of the 21st century use a combination of various uh, elements in the armor. So these elements include uh, hard metal, uh, various types of plastic, uh, ceramic, uh, fused silica glass in the armor. And uh, the Soviets, the Soviets, they made something called the combination K during the 60s for their T-64 tanks. While the United States, UK and uh, NATO forces, they adopt something called uh, the Chobam armor, which was developed by uh, the uh, armored military uh, corps from uh, the uh, British, uh, which is developed by them, which is the Chobam armor. So these type of techniques are used in the 21st century combat in order to go against the anti-tag weapons and tactics. So these have been extensively uh, spoken about in my research paper, but just I gave you a small, uh, very brief analysis of it. Well, thank, thank you very, you much. very much. There is another question to Hiranta, Hiranta Vijay Singh. What sort of a mechanism do you suggest the intelligence agencies to follow in getting civilian information? I think this is a very imp in important question. Usually police 
maintains uh, uh, very close rapport with the uh, civilian population, like in Indonesia. And um, well, that is one way. And now you are uh, advocating this idea to the military. Uh, of course, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, I think uh, in, in tracing those people, uh, military, uh, use civilian information, that, that's, that's very uh, true. Um, but do you advocate that there should, be, uh, uh, there should be collaboration between the police and the military? Or you are uh, expressing the idea of having a joint uh, task force, sometimes uh, uh, collecting intelligence, sometimes it is secretive. So how do you maintain confidentiality and all that? And I think uh, this involves a lot of uh, areas. Uh, you can address this issue. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amal, uh, sir. It's a very uh, important uh, question. So even now, Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, military and law enforcement authorities, there are several intelligence agencies working in different areas. So uh, lack of intelligence sharing, as I said, with the community and the authorities uh, is there. Also, that is there within the different intelligence agencies also, because we see intelligence agencies in the police department, we see intelligence agencies in the military, and um, Air Force, Navy, so there are a lot of information uh, uh, being gathering, maybe on the same uh, issue, same cases, but uh, the, the, it's not being shared at the, at the lower level, maybe it's shared at the very strategic level, but when it comes to intelligence, it's really important, uh, the, the, the accuracy and also it has to be in a very timely manner. So here, uh, what we can uh, do is in the United States, there is a concept uh, called uh, fusion centers. It's, it's, a, it's a statewide uh, establishment where every state, every uh, region, they started uh, after the 9-11 attacks um, in to, uh, 2001. And uh, they started with 72 fusion centers. Uh, this fusion center is a kind of intelligence sharing network where it's a physical um, establishment, uh, it's a statewide, where intelligence of officers from different agencies, it could be the military, it could be the, the, the police, uh, it could be the homeland security, uh, the engine, not only the security sector, there will be also uh, uh, the judiciary, so, and, 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 and the lawyers, and others who are, who are interested, uh, who are in this process of investigating, and, uh, enforcing the law are in that system. So they will take care of that area, the state, the area that is given for them. And the civilian entity is also one part of that. So so, so if you take the different uh, officers from uh, military intelligence are in, at the same place and also they get the information, they will get the information and they will um, disseminate it and with the support of the terrorist early warning group. So this, this civilian uh, team will work at, work at the same uh, loca location, so they will coordinate with the information uh, to get that, um, uh, and they, they will work as a, uh, they, they are also a part of this uh, fusion center. So a lot, lot of um, uh, groundwork has to be done, a lot of uh, reforms has to be done in the, the security sector, and I think uh, next also we are just uh, researching on how, how, how different agencies in the in the country can work together in um, facing the common issue actually as you said uh, sir we saw in the covid 19 pandemic how different agencies worked together in um, getting the information tracing the the, the, the uh, tracing the uh, patients and all so i think when it comes to counter terrorism also uh, it's very important get, to get these uh, civilians involved and also the information it's not uh, if if it's not uh, shared within the state level, uh, so this fusion center, this mechanism will be in a, in the middle, coordinating that information you receive from the society to the higher levels of the uh, uh, intelligence agencies of the governments. Well, thank you very much. Actually, in West Africa, there was a civil society organization. Uh, when there are terrorist attacks or about to happen, uh, they monitor the marketplace. When there is a, 
you know, shortage of grain and all these things. And uh, they know that there is something, you know, something is going to happen because people are buying in excess. And when they observe and when they find out more about it, they, they, they get to know that there will be a terrorist attack very soon. And that kind of information, now for example, in, you know, uh, Bombay attack by those uh, people who came from Pakistan in dinghies, uh, people said that you have to have information, your intelligence collecting network with uh, fishing villages. And like that, it's a, it's a very, very important idea you presented. And uh, are there any other questions from the audience here? I think they have presented the, the questions here. Any other question? Yeah. Hmm? Time. Time. Yeah. Time. Uh, so we had a very uh, interesting and very useful discussion. Uh, let me thank all the paper presenters and uh, for the audience uh, for making this a very useful uh, presentation and uh, session technical session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was a vibrant discussion. I'm confident we have gained insight on some of the latest developments in the military domain. I would like to once again thank the chairperson, Professor Emeritus Amal Jawadana, for taking time off his busy schedule to attend the 14th International Research Conference. And I would also want to express my gratitude to our presenters, N. Nilanta, K. C. D. Silva, and N. Rana Singha, T. Bandara, R. J. Pintu, D. C. N. Hapuarachi, H. S. Vijay Singha, and M. Ajwe for their contribution under the theme, Military Affairs. Now, I would like to call upon Brigadier R.G. Rajapaksha, RSP, PSC, Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, to present the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Sanat De Silva. Sir, may we have you on stage, please? Thank you, sir. Sir, please remain on stage. Now, we will present a token of appreciation to the chairperson of the first technical session, Professor Emeritus Amal Jawadana. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we conclude the first technical session on defense and strategic studies for the 14th International Research Conference. Please be seated at 10.50 a.m. for the next session. Thank you.